So if you were watching television at all yesterday, you probably saw a number of memorials for 9-11. We are 20 years post that event. Uh, It probably changed the landscape of the United States of America in terms of the way that we responded to circumstances in different ways. And it just seems to me that of the stories that I heard, there were fewer stories about the courage of people. I mean, we hear about the courageous men and women, fire department, police department, the people that were on the planes, all those kinds of things. But for some reason in today's society, courage seems to be a little waning. So I thought that I would deliver hopefully a message of encouragement to you about taking courage, because I think we all can. And the text of the message is taken from Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 through 31 been kind of camping on the Beatitudes of late. I appreciate Steve and the message that you delivered last Sunday. Thank you very much for doing that. I think the church really benefited from you doing so. Matthew chapter 10 verses 26 through 31. But don't be afraid of those who threaten you, for the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed, and all that is secret will be made known to all. What I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when the daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They can't touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, what is the price of two sparrows? Uh, A copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. The person I'm about to introduce to you was a professional thief. His name struck fear in the hearts of men and women alike. He terrorized the Wells Fargo stage line for 13 years. He'd roar in like a tornado out of the Sierra Nevada hillsides and in journals from San Francisco to New York. His name became synonymous with the dangers of, at the time, the great frontier. During his reign of terror between 1875 and 1883, he is credited with stealing the breath and bags away from 28 different stagecoach crews. And he did it all without firing a single shot. His weapon was his reputation. His ammunition was intimidation. He had a flour sack that had holes cut out for his eyes, which would hide his face. No victim ever, ever saw him. No artist ever sketched his features. No sheriff could ever track his trail. He never fired a shot, and he never took a hostage. He didn't have to, because his presence was enough to paralyze. His name was Black Bart. He was a hooded bandit with a deadly weapon. And he reminds me of another thief. We've never seen this thief's face either. And we couldn't describe his voice or sketch his profile, just like Black Bart. But when he's near, we know it immediately because if you've ever been in a hospital you've felt that leathery brush of his hand against your own if you've ever sensed someone was following you you have felt his cold breath breathing down your neck and if you've ever awakened late at night maybe in a strange room it was his husky whisper that stole your sleep that evening You know him. It was this thief 
who left your palms sweaty as you went in maybe for that job interview. It was this con man who convinced you to swap your integrity for popularity. And it was this scoundrel who whispered in your ear as you left the cemetery, you know, you might be next. He's the black Bart of the soul. The thing is, he doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your diamonds. He doesn't even want your car. He wants something that is a whole lot more precious. He wants your peace of mind. He wants your joy. And his name is called fear. His job is to take your courage and leave you a timid, trembling wreck. And his modus operandi is to manipulate you with mysterious things and taunt you with the unknown, fear of death, fear of failure, fear of God, fear of tomorrow, fear of COVID. His arsenal is enormous. And his goal is to create cowardly, joyless souls. That's his goal. He doesn't want you to take that trip up the mountain. He figures that if he can rattle you just enough, you'll take your eyes off that peak that you're striving to achieve and settle for a dull existence somewhere out in the prairie. A legend from India, the country, describes a mouse who was terrified of cats until a magician agreed to transform the mouse into a cat. That resolved his fear until he met a dog. And the mouse turned cat, turned dog, or asked the magician to change him into a dog. So the magician changed him into a dog, and that was fine until the dog met a tiger. So he went back to the magician, and now the mouse turned cat turned dog was content until he met that tiger. So once again, the magician changed him into what he feared. But when the tiger came, complaining that he'd met a hunter, the magician refused to help him. The magician said, I'm going to make you into a mouse again because you may have the body of a tiger, but you still have the heart of a mouse. Does that sound at all familiar to you? I mean, how many people do you know who've built this really formidable exterior only to tremble inside with fear? I mean, we tackle our anxieties by taking on the appearance of a tiger. We face our fears with force. Maybe it's military power. Maybe it's security systems. Maybe it's defense strategies. And they all reflect this conviction that muscle creates security. Or if we don't use force, we try other methods. So we stockpile wealth. We seek security in stuff. We cultivate fame and pursue popularity. But can power or possessions or popularity ever, ever really deliver us from our fears? No. Because if power could, then Joseph Stalin should have been fearless. Instead, the infamous Russian dictator was afraid to go to bed at night. He had seven different bedrooms, and each could be locked as tightly as a safe. And in order to foil any would-be assassin, he slept in a different bedroom every night. He had five chauffeur-driven limousines transport him wherever he went, each with curtains closed so no one would know which car actually contained 
the dictator Joseph Stalin. In fact, so deep-seated were his apprehensions that he employed a servant whose singular responsibility was to monitor and to protect his tea bags. And if possessions could conquer fear, the late billionaire Howard Hughes would have been fearless, don't you think? But you probably know of his story. His distrust of people and his paranoia of germs led this billionaire to Mexico where he died a lonely death as a cadaverous hermit with a belt-length beard and corkscrew fingernails. Okay, well then what about popularity? Maybe popularity will fix the fear. Well, if that's true, then John Lennon's fame as a singer, as a songwriter, and pop icon made him a household word. But his fears only brought him misery. His biographers describe him as a very frightened man, unwilling to sleep with the lights off and afraid to touch anything because of its filth. Now granted, Stalin, Hughes, Lennon are extreme cases, but I do think they're illustrative. And it kind of reminds me of that Indian proverb or tale. Though you have the body of a tiger, you still have the heart of a mouse. Courage is an outgrowth of who we are inside. Exterior supports, they might temporarily sustain us, but only inward character creates courage. And it's those inward convictions that Jesus was building in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 church is not a list of proverbs or a compilation of independent sayings. I think it is instead a step-by-step-by-step description of how God rebuilds a believer's heart. And the first step is to ask for help, to become poor in spirit by admitting our need for a savior. And the next step is followed by sorrow. Blessed are those who mourn because those who mourn know they're wrong and they say they're sorry. No excuses for it, no justification. They just know they're wrong. And then the sorrow sometimes leads to tears. And the first two steps, church, are an admission of inadequacy and repentance from pride. The next step is one of renewal. Blessed are those who are meek. Because, church, a realization of weakness leads to our source of strength which is God. And renewal comes when we become meek, when we give our lives to God so that we can be his tool, his instrument in this creation that he has made. The first two Beatitudes kind of pass us through the fire of purification, and the third places us in the hands of the Master. And the result of the process is courage because Jesus said, the meek shall what? Inherit the earth. No longer shall the earth and its fears dominate us for we follow the one who dominates the earth. So could you use maybe a little courage? Are you backing down more than you're standing up? If so, I want to let the master lead you up that mountain again. Let him remind you why you should fear not. Listen to the time that Jesus scattered the butterflies out of the stomachs of these very nervous disciples and maybe just see if his words will help you. 
Now, before we get to what he said, we need to remember the disciples were common men that were given a very compelling task. But before they were the stained glass saints in the windows of cathedrals worldwide, they were somebody's next door neighbor trying to make a buck and raise a family. Those are the disciples we're talking about. They weren't cut from any kind of theological cloth or raised on some sort of supernatural spiritual milk. But they were an ounce more devoted than they were afraid. And as a result, they did some extraordinary things. They would have done nothing, however, had they not learned to face their fears. And Jesus knew that. That is why he spoke his words of courage. So I want to paint for you the picture that leads up to Jesus talking in Matthew chapter five, the Beatitudes. The disciples are going to be sent out on their own and for a limited time, they will go to cities and do what Jesus has done, but this time without Jesus. Jesus assembles them and gives them their final instructions And maybe the disciples look a little nervous. And I think they have reason to be nervous. What Jesus tells them would quicken the pulse rate of the best athlete. First, Jesus tells them not to take any extra money or extra clothing on their journey. Basically, just the clothes on your back. Then he assures them that they are being sent out like sheep among wolves. And his answer to their eventual questioning is not very reassuring. He tells them that they will be taken before authorities, they will be flogged, and they will be arrested. And that's the good news, because it gets worse. Jesus goes on to describe the impact that their mission will have on people. He says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 21 and 22, brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And at this point, church, I'm thinking that some eyes are kind of ducking away from Jesus. Some eyes are probably wide open like you are kidding me. Someone maybe swallows, maybe some feet are shifting, a brow is wiped, and though no one says it, I think you kind of get the impression that maybe one of them is thinking, is it too late to get out of this? And that is now the setting for Jesus' paragraph on courage. Three times in five verses, Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 through 31, he says, do not be afraid. And I want you to go home today and read the words and see his call and his cause calling you to have courage. See the reason you should sleep well tonight. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 26, he says, So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. Now, on the surface, those words would seem like a reason for panic rather than a source of peace. I mean, who of us would like to have our secret thoughts made public? Who would want our own private sins published? Who would get excited over the idea that every wrong deed that we've ever done will be announced to everyone? You're right, no one would be excited. But we're told over and over that such a thing will happen. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. 
Daniel chapter 2, verse 22, he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, though he is surrounded by light. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, but I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. And then, following up in Psalm chapter 90, verse 8, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 4 or 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5 it says you spread out our sins before you our secret sins and you see them all he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives now to think of the disclosure of my hidden heart that conjures up shame and humiliation and embarrassment. I mean, there are things I've done that very few people know about. There are thoughts I've thought that I really wouldn't want to have revealed. So why does Jesus point to the day of revelation as a reason to have courage? That's craziness. How can we possibly take strength in what should be a moment of abject anguish? The answer is found in Romans chapter 2, verse 16. And church, you can let out a sigh of relief as you hear the last three words. Here's what Romans 2, 16 says. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? And if you read it, did you really read it through Jesus Christ? In other words, Jesus is the screen through which God looks when he judges our sins. Now, another chorus of verses share the same thing and listen to their promise. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, and Romans chapter 3, verse 26, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul continues, God justifies those who have faith in Jesus. In Acts chapter 13, verse 39, through him everyone who believes is justified from everything. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Church, here's what I'm trying to say. If you are in Jesus Christ, these promises are not only a source of joy, but they are the foundation for true courage. You are guaranteed that your sins will be filtered through, hidden in, and screened out by the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your mess. He sees the one who hides it, Jesus. That means that failure is no longer a concern of yours because your victory is absolutely certain and secure. So how could you not be courageous? I want you to just maybe picture it this way. Imagine that you're an ice skater in an Olympic competition and you are in first place and there is one more round for you to skate competitively. And if you perform well, you know, the gold medal will be yours. But man, you're nervous. Oops. You're anxious. You're frightened. And then just minutes maybe even just moments before your performance, your coach rushes up to you with this thrilling news. Hey, you've already won. The judges tabulated the scores and the person in second place cannot catch you. You're too far ahead. Now, if you heard that news, how would you feel? 
Well, I'd feel pretty exhilarated, I think. I'd feel pretty happy. And how would you skate? Would you go out there and skate timidly? Would you go out there and skate afraid? Would you be cautious? No. You'd skate your heart out, right? You would skate courageously and confidently. You'd do your best because why? The prize is already yours. You have nothing to fear. You'd skate like a champion because you know what? That's what you are. You'd hear the applause of victory and hence these words from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and then skipping to verse 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of our faith. The point of all this is this. The truth will triumph. The father of truth will win. And the followers of truth will be saved. As a result, Jesus says, don't be afraid. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, he says, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both in hell. In the big picture, earthly fears then become no fears at all because all the mystery has been revealed. There's no surprises. The final destination has been guaranteed. Answer the big question of eternity and the little questions of life tend to fall into place. By the way, remember Black Bart? Well, as it turns out, he wasn't really anything to be afraid of. When the hood came off, there was absolutely nothing to fear. When the authorities finally were able to track him down, they didn't find some bloodthirsty bandit from Death Valley. He was a mild-mannered druggist from Decatur, Illinois. The man that Papers had pictured storming through the mountains on horseback was, in reality, so afraid of horses that he rode to and from his robberies in a buggy and then robbed the stagecoaches on foot. His name was Charles E. Bowles. And that bandit never once fired a shot because he never once loaded his gun. So, this week, do you know of any false hoods in your world? Fears that you see that make you frightened, that you think you cannot recover from, think you cannot challenge? Any false hoods like the hood that Black Bart wore? Do you know of any of those? If so, take heart and take courage because the victory has been promised to you and it's assured. There's nothing that can separate you from God, nothing. And so we can take courage in a world that seems to be lacking a little bit in courage these days. Not courage in and of ourselves, but courage of whose we are and the promises that have been made to us. So this week, kind of a post 9-11 discussion maybe at the office if you still are going into work, but maybe with friends or relatives, spouses, children. Give them this message of hope. Tell them that they can be courageous when so many are not because you've been promised a life with God forever.